Hi everyone. Thanks very much for coming to our day film today. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respect to the elders, past, present and emerging. This is um, Philip Fox's first exhibition in our gallery and it's been a long time coming. Philip has shown in our uh, other gallery previously in our architect's drawing exhibition for quite a number of times and um, so this is his first major solo exhibition in our gallery in this space. I first come across Philip, I, I couldn't say that I met him because he was giving a talk at the architecture faculty when I was an architecture student at Sydney Uni and um, I was very inspired by his talk but I never really you know, come across him much. I mean, of course, I know about his work as an architect. Um, in fact, I was working for Edwards Medic and Tarsil and Bricks when we were in North Sydney, and we had an office, you know, a couple of floors above Philip's office when he was working in Ilara. But um, my connection with Philip is actually through art. Um, I think he um, came to my gallery when we first opened in 2009 and, and in Bondi Junction. And um, subsequent to that, we've become friends. Um, I've invited him to be a, a director on the board of Aboriginal Benefits Foundation and then he also invited me to be a director on the board of East Asia New South Wales Art Gallery to support Asian art and, um, and so we've been talking about this exhibition for a short while and then here we are and so I think as you can see Philip is a renaissance man, he's a contemporary renaissance man he's, he's um, an architect, he's an artist and he loved nature, He's, I mean, you should have a look at his book and, and buy a copy of that. Um, and it's a lovely, lovely space he's got there on the south coast. And, um, but tonight, it's about his art. So I think the best person to talk about his art is Lou Kripak. He is, um, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just give you a very brief introduction, Lou. Everybody knows Lou, so he doesn't need any introduction. But um, he's a curator, he's an art historian, He's a publisher, he's um, publishing books through Beagle Press, and um, here we are, Lou, Lou Kivak. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Philip asked me, because I, I, I'm very fond of Philip, I, I said I would say, I say, I would say, yes, I would say something. And then I thought myself, Christ Almighty, you know, how can I say something? And usually people say to me, be short, and I'm not going to be short because because my son showed me something the other day which is magnificent. On the computer, he set up something and I can just dictate my notes and now they come printed. So they come up, before that I used to write them all down by hand and they were shorter. Now it's so much easier and I, I had them printed. So the first time I'm actually looking at my notes are printed here. So I'm sorry about that. And uh, first of all, I'm not talking about Philip at all. I said, I'm telling you something to, something to consider and then some, something for you to remember. Two things. Something to consider and something to remember. I said, did you know that, when, when we, that we do not really know who we are? The reason for this is because we know ourselves only by going day after day, into the bathroom to brush our teeth. And the person that meets us there is not who we think we are. Think about that. The mirror image is not us. Nature provided us with an instinct to protect ourselves. As we grow up, we can soon recognize an aggressive gesture. We also begin to learn how to assess people's character from what their faces tell us. We are not very good about that usually, but it is a guide. We have two faces. The right side of our face is the face we present to the world, the Napoleon side, and the left side is our, the, the, the face of our soul, our vulnerable side. Now, when we see somebody and we look at their right hand side of the face, we can gauge who they are. Uh, if you see 
uh, a lady with a very strong right face, you know that she's actually wearing the trousers in the home. <laughs> but we actually, in the mirror, we look at the, what, was, what we think is our right side, and we look at our weak side, and we think we are weaker than we really are. Now, if you really want to know who you really are, when you go to David Jones and go into a cubicle to, to uh, try on some garments, look at the image in one mirror reflected in the other. And that image is who you are and what do you look like to the world. So that's it, there we are. Now, when you look at the, a, a portrait of Rembrandt next time, a self-portrait, and you try to assess what he was like as a man, you actually think twice because that is a little bit of a delusion as well. What is, has this got to do with Philip Cox? <laughs> <laughs> Philip's career also has two sides. The public side is his great achievement as an architect, which you can find documented in the book published about two years ago, Philip Cox and Australian Architecture. An important bit coming. <laughs> and, when, and when you have looked at it, you will be amazed how little you know about his achievement as an architect. I will mention just three projects to look for the Asian Stadium in Bangkok, the Founders Memorial in Singapore, and the incredible National Maritime Museum in China. You will, you will be surprised and, and staggered by what he has been able to achieve. And they're not around the corner. You have to get his book and have a look. There are 200, and the book is not here. There are 237 pages in this book, but only two pages in this book about Philip are of concern to us. And the two pages are the, are the epilogue, which explains the connection that Philip has with this exhibition. It says that in, in the 1970s, Philip acquired a large piece of land some 400 miles south of Sydney, mm. which he has been tendering with loving care ever since. It was featured on a television program not so long ago. It was such a revelation to me that after seeing it, I called Philip, I dubbed him God's Gardener. <laughs> and in the book on, on this garden, which is up there, you will read what he says here. He says, it is the most intimate and personal projects I have ever created. And you, are, you must find the segment uh, on, on, I think it was Hazen Gardens or something like that. Jen um, or, um, warned me and I watched it and I couldn't believe what a fantastic thing it is. And that is so important to this exhibition. This exhibition would be the same. Uh, the thing is that modern day architects often fiddle with art, but they're not usually very good. It is often just a, a pleasant distraction. Philip is lucky in that he has some important advantages. First, a great love of nature, which has been able to observe and study from not just one, but two fabulous retreats. One being the garden already mentioned, and the other, a house which has a miraculous 180 degrees view of the sea. It is an, uh, another place which I've been and I, I, I ne have never forgotten it. It's, it remains, as, as, it's an incredible thing. It's like being, uh, like being God. And secondly, Philip has been lucky to have had an important association and friendship with the great Lloyd Reeves, who has influenced his work. Someone said to me, it's Monet. It's not Monet, it's Lloyd Reeves. I know that Philip has my book on Lloyd Reed's 1930 drawings of Sydney because he launched the book at the Sydney Museum. I unfortunately wasn't present at that launch because I was fiddling around with the destination Sydney which I had actually organised and some silly woman, I won't mention who, but very famous, made a stupid speech and I was really angry that I couldn't be there for this incredible uh, launch of this book. I should say who it was, but I won't. <laughs> in, this, in the drawings, 
in the 1930s, Lloyd made fantastic drawings with a sharpened 1B and 2B pencils where through tone he created some amazing drawings. Now if Lloyd were here tonight, he would be very complimentary and impressed by what Philip has produced. He, like me, would say that these things are sonnets to nature. And there are some lovely, really lovely works here, better than I thought when I saw the photographs sent to me the other day. However, he and I would think that we have the right to make a slight criticism. One of the things that bothers me, and might bother, bother Lloyd Rees as well, is that an instrument of precision, like a drafting pen, has to be left home in the architect's office. And you should take with you either a dipping pen or a carbon pencil. Lloyd would say that you have to use something organic with something organic. Now, in some cases, the little black lines, like little worms, are bothering me. But in some cases, actually, they, they, they work perfectly well. And I am happy to see that, that to take them away would be a mistake. So, Philip, it's one way or the other. <laughs> Philip Instinct also has saved him, uh, really has protected him by responding to the incredible trees that grow in his, in his garden, straight up. I think they're called spotted guns. And in, re, uh, in dealing with them, he has in many cases put everything on one plane. Let me explain. There are two ways of making a painting. One is to create a door for the eye to enter and then to explore what is there. The other is much more direct. Everything is put on one plane and the image, like a shower of light, hits you in the eye at once, enters your brain and diffuses itself into your consciousness. And many of the works here are of that type. Let me finish then by telling you how the invention of a new paint enabled two artists to create some remarkable original works where the image enters, exists on one plane. And this is a bit for you to remember. The rest you can consider and think and you have your own opinions and it's fine and Philip can actually can, can, uh, can throw away his, his drafting pen. During the first two decades of the century, there was much talk of a recently invented paint in Holland that went under the name of Ripollin. Ripollin was the first enamel paint invented and was then manufactured in France. Gertrude Stein, in her book The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, published in 1933, mentioned that Picasso used Ripollin and that he thought it was a very good paint. Two painters, others as well, but that two that I'm mentioning here, noticed this mention of Ripollin. One was Jackson Pollock and the other was Sidney Nolan. I believe that Pollock ordered Ripollin from France and Nolan from, from the UK. Enamel paint does not come in tubes, it comes in tins, it runs, and to use it you have to paint with it on a horizontal plane. Pollock dripped it onto large canvases placed on the floor, while Nolan painted his Kelly paintings on a table at Heidi. Pollock began to drip paint on canvas only in 1947. He had been a traditional painter and then became an abstract, while Nolan, who began by painting abstract works, became figurative. It is worth noting that by the time Pollock painted Blue Pearls in 1952, the five years younger Nolan had already completed most of the celebrated Ned Kelly series. When you are next in the National Gallery in Canberra, besides reminding them that there's two pictures that are connected by Ripley, which they don't, they don't know, you might look at these two pictures and see how the paint is on one plane and the image comes to you like a speeding train. Now, Philip has my book on Lloyd's 1930 drawings of Sydney, but perhaps he has not seen my much earlier book on Lloyd's drawings published back in 1978 
when Lloyd was not yet the sensation that he became in the 1980s. In it, you will find examples where Lloyd has made use of the carbon pencil in relation to watercolor washes. And you will find also lots of drawings in pen and ink with washes over them. But it's a dipping pen. Lloyd used the dipping pen and even a fountain pen. And when I asked him why a fountain pen, he explained that he used it nip upside down so that the ink would splatter and not leave an even line. Lloyd was very cunning. He had a drawing board encrusted with sand so that when he placed a drawing on it and made a drawing on, on the top of it, a pattern of, of shapes came behind the drawing to give it a bit of a, a relief. Now, to make amends for my criticism about the black lines, which I, I, I like more and more, by the way. <laughs> First, let me uh, give Philip a copy of my 1978 Lloyd's book, drawings book. <laughs> with us tonight and, and he will be enjoying the show. I also like to acknowledge um, Lord Mayor Clover Moore of City of Sydney who is with us. I think she's very familiar with Philip's work but she's here to look at Philip's art. Um, so Philip. Well thank you Simon very much for <clears throat> putting on the show and firstly thank you all you people, my friends. Thank you Peter and Clover for coming. Uh, I think it's a great honour that you're here tonight, and, and it's a great honour that we've got so many people in the art world here. Um, thank you to Melanie, who has done a tremendous amount in organisation, uh, of organising caterers and things like that, and thank you Janet Hawley for being persistent in getting this show underway. <laughs> but firstly, I'm, I'm, I don't like correcting the, the esteemed art historian. But Lloyd Reese didn't use B pencils, he used H pencils. He used a 4H and a 2H. And that's why his drawings were so pre precise and non blurred. So, dear historian, get your facts straight. Thanks. I didn't look into my book. <laughs> And I was always amazed at the, you know, the steel-like qualities of, of the Reese's sketches that were totally unblurred. It was because of the 4-H and not having the smudgy qualities that you get with a B uh, carbonised pencil. But apart from that, I forgive you from all my little black worms or lines on the on his end. But the reaction to this particular show is because of my love of nature, my love of the south coast and the wonderful primeval forests that we, we, we are custodians of down there. So the, the, <clears throat> the book that I produced on the garden is really not a garden per se. The garden is, is quite irrelevant around the house, but what is relevant is the preservation of the bushland, the, the maculata or the spotted gum forest, the swamplands, the maculata. It, that is the important thing. And I was only thinking that we spend our lives looking at images that aren't true from nature. We're looking at computers, we're looking at telephones, we're looking at TVs. Everything is screened uh, that we see is second hand, third hand even. And to be able to get into nature, to be able to communicate with nature first hand, I think it's a great quality. And I somehow think that the, um, 
younger generation doesn't get that opportunity enough. And that perhaps a lot of the, the opportunities that we had growing up where we weren't taken to school by our parents, we walked to school yeah. or we biked to school. Yeah. We wandered the bushlands around the you know, neighbourhood. We had a complete and utter freedom. We didn't have a fear of somebody molesting us or anything like that. We never thought of things like that. Yeah, it was just great freedom. And yeah. nature played a most important part in our lives. And I think that, that growing up with nature is important and I somehow feel it's not as important in the current education of, of young people. And it's not the same opportunity they have. They see it on the screen rather than experiencing it themselves. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this exhibition. I went, um, it's all about the Mara, excepting I think there's one painting of Ayers Rock, which, or near Ayers Rock, which um, um, uh, is a reflection of when we were doing Yalara um, many years ago. But I, I also want to thank my various uh, directors uh, here tonight who came, who always supported art within our office environment. And yes, they have supported everyone being more of the Renaissance person of understanding sculpture, art, literature, music as being an integral part of, of the creation of architecture. And I see this is an important ingredient which is sometimes lost in our universities that we, we don't have enough contact with the Lloyd Rees or the Roland Wakem type people or the musicians that we should, or the literature that we, uh, <clears throat> we, we should have to understand, as Donald Horne in, um, you know, pointed out, that you know, Australian <coughs> culture is in is early Dory. It's in its infancy. It needs to grow. And I only you know, hope that, the, that we do refine an Australian identity in the works that we're doing, both in, right across the art. And it's good to know that Clover and her team do support Australian content, which is very, very important in our community, and to enrich that and to give further opportunity for great works to be done. Thank you. Oh. We, we should have had this exhibition yesterday because it was Lloyd's birthday. Oh. <laughs>